the gold clause cases in the 1930s, um, were, were they the implication also saying that the government had the right to break uh, a private contract? Uh, Given the fact that you know it was quite clearly stated that it was at the option of the uh, holder of that um, bond that they had the right to take uh, delivery in gold. Well, there were actually two or three gold clause cases that were consolidated before the Supreme Court. And only one of them involved government bonds. Mm -hmm. The other involved, uh, as I recall it, railroad bonds, but they were private bonds. And so when it came to the issue of private bonds, uh, the court, and I really have to go back and take a closer look at the opinion, but the court basically got into a, an issue of, well, whether those clauses could interfere with the government's monetary powers to set the gold price. Now, nobody doubted that this Congress had the power to set the gold weight of the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was a question in those cases whether if Congress decided to change the gold weight of the dollar, somebody in a private contract could interfere, so to speak, with that power. That was one set of issues, but in the government bond cases, then you had the issue that you're raising, which is the government's promise to pay you X weight of gold once you make the translation from the parity through the dollars. Can they change that contract? And the court struggled with that because the court didn't really think, you know, the government just doesn't have the power to uh, change the terms of the contract under which it's borrowed money. But the way they kind of got around it at the time was to say, but actually the new dollars are worth, in terms of purchasing power, the same as the old dollars. So we're going to let you get away with it. Yeah, this so time. it's a skirting around but the edges. The, the, the truth is, the way it's phrased, I mean, if that hadn't been true, uh, the court probably would have come out the other way around. Yeah. Have there been any major court decisions since the 1930s? No, or? that's it. There's, it's another very interesting thing about all these cases is that the legal tender cases, and there was an earlier series that found the greenbacks unconstitutional. Then there was a change in the composition of the court. As I recall, it actually two judges retired and one new one was appointed or two, mm -hmm. they left. And so they had a different lineup. Mm -hmm. And so they went from one vote against the constitutionality of the greenbacks to one vote in favor of them. But they were, one, controversial, and two, they're very lengthy opinions. I mean, I can't remember the number of pages, but you know, it yeah. takes up a, a chunk in the law books that's pretty good sized. And the same is true with the gold clause cases. I mean, these were uh, huge cases when they were uh, decided, a lot of public interest, and uh, since the gold clause cases, uh, well, really there hadn't, wasn't any reason to get back into this subject until Nixon closed the gold window. And that's why you would have thought, you know, for the Civil War, you had the legal tender cases. Then for the New Deal, you had the gold clause cases. Nixon was going to close the window. As I said, there should have been the fiat money cases. Yeah. I mean, because it's a different issue. Whatever you, you make perfectly good arguments that the legal tender cases and the gold clause cases were wrongly decided. They probably were, but it, the link still ex existed. And so what Nixon did was just an order of magnitude different. And uh, as I say, there's no, there's really no way that the fiat dollar can be squared with the language of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the courts have been very reluctant to take this question on because they can't write a decent opinion in favor of the fiat money, but they don't really want to interfere with the system. I mean, it's just one of these issues that scares but, them too much. But isn't the court supposed well, to be they're, they're, you know, outside <laughs> yes. of the political influence? And, <laughs> they're, they're and I mean, even the case where you're saying it was five to four, they switched the, uh, the membership of the court over a period of years because of retirement and right. whatnot, and it went five to four the other way. I mean, it, it, you know, facts are facts. Law is law. You know, uh, English is a very clear language in terms of what's written. So it sounds like there's a lot of subjective um, judgment that you know, went into those decisions.